I was talking with uh, Austin earlier uh, before the event, and he tells me he's a French horn player, and it's one of the hardest instruments uh, to play in any uh, musical ensemble. And uh, I, I told him that I played the violin, and that was the second hardest instrument to play. And he said, oh, you were a strolling violinist, I heard. And so I, I really appreciated his, uh, his very thoughtful uh, introduction. I want to thank also um, Skip Rutherford and uh, Nikolai de Pippa uh, for, for having me here today. It's, uh, and all of you for coming, all the volunteers who make this possible. Uh, Bob took me on a tour uh, of the center. I was here for the opening 10 years ago, and it was very muddy, and I never made it inside, and, and I, I would have had to take off my shoes uh, not to track in the mud. Uh, so I, was, I, was, I made it inside today, and, and it brought back so many uh, good memories and, 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 and really brought back the feeling of inspiration uh, that the president uh, instilled in, in, in me and so many others and in, in, in the, the students here who are going on to lives of, of public service. And I'm especially happy uh, to be here at this forum because we, we live in such a time of point scoring and, and, and attacks and, and divisiveness uh, that, that forums that provide uh, a place for the, the ex exchange of ideas in a calm and uh, insightful way, it's rarer and rarer and all the more important because of it. So, so I'd just like to thank the Clinton School uh, for doing this and adding to, uh, me to a long list of uh, speakers. I'm going to talk uh, tonight about the unrecognized uh, but often critical power of analogy in the way we think about challenges, determine policy, and persuade uh, people we're right. About 15 years ago, I was sitting in my apartment in uh, DuPont Circle in Washington, and I was uh, unemployed, unshaven. I had just gotten back from a long trip uh, to uh, the former Soviet Georgia, former, uh, former Soviet Republic of Georgia, and I was wondering, uh, you know, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? I had worked on Capitol Hill. I had left Capitol Hill to take a creative sabbatical and figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And suddenly I was, I was out there, and, and, and it wasn't clear to me. And the phone rang, and I, I picked it up. This was pre, before I had a cell phone. I was sitting there. And, and I picked it up, and, and it was, this is Josh Gottheimer, at the White House Office of Speechwriting. Is this John Pollack? I said, yes. And he said, well, we have an opening uh, on the president's staff one of our speech writers is leaving, would you be interested in uh, applying for the job? And that took me about half a second to say yes. And he said, well, you, can you come in this afternoon? And I, I, there I was literally in cut off jeans and a t-shirt and, and I hadn't shaved in two weeks. And I said, would tomorrow morning be a possibility? And he said, okay, facts in your resume. We have your writing on file. And I had applied a couple of times uh, before, uh, but I hadn't gotten it. I had gotten close, but I hadn't gotten it. This was going to be my last, last shot. And I went in uh, the, the next morning. I was sitting in a, on a couch uh, in the basement of the West Wing uh, in the office of uh, Terry Edmonds, the chief speechwriter. And he's sitting behind this big wooden desk. And I'm trying to not sink into this, the cushions of this old couch and not fall off the front and not say the wrong thing. And he's looking through my writing, he's looking at my resume, and he says, well, I, I can see you're qualified for the job, and I, I know you can write, but, but what's this about a cork boat? 
And I, I had put on the, uh, the last line of the resume uh, that I was currently building the, the world's first cork boat. And I, in part because I needed to account for myself and what I was doing at, at, the, at the time of being unemployed. And I explained that I had saved corks from the age of six and I was going to build a Viking ship and take it on an epic journey. Uh, <laughs> ideally through French wine country. <laughs> and he said, uh, he looked at me like I was crazy, and, and I, could, I could see this slipping away, this, this last opportunity. The administration clock is ticking down, and I'd just blown it, and, and, and out of nowhere, and I don't know how this happened, into my mind popped an analogy. And I said, well, you know, sir, uh, building a cork boat is, is a lot like writing a good speech. And... He pushes the glasses to the top of his head and leans back, and this I've got to hear. And, and I said, well, in both cases, you take a, a jumble of, of small things that, uh, without organization, mean nothing. But if you put them into just the right order, they'll take you on an amazing journey. And, and then I shut up. So he got the analogy, he, he paused, and then this reluctant but huge grin spread across his face. I think he, he figured that, that maybe he didn't admire my nautical ambitions, but he admired the silver shovel, and uh, <laughs> he got the analogy and I got the job. And that was, the, that was a great job. I, I loved uh, working for President Clinton. He uh, elevated debate. Uh, he cared about language, he cared about the substance, and, and to, to work uh, for him was a, a great honor and privilege, and I, I learned a, a great deal. And, I, and as I say, I was a, a small, very small rivet in building the bridge to the 21st century. So what is an analogy? Uh, people of my generation and older who took the SAT well, think of it as a, as a sort of logical test question. Uh, an Indy 500 uh, car is, is to the racing, is, is a thoroughbred is to the Kentucky Derby, something like that. And that's true, it's one type of analogy. But it's only one type. They come in a lot of uh, forms, they wear a lot of disguises, and, and they actually can be very complex. Uh, parables, ads, proverbs, similes, metaphors, euphemisms, uh, those are all types of analogy. And once you start tuning up your awareness, you start hearing them everywhere. Just the other day I was reading the paper and the Greek finance minister uh, was describing austerity policies as f fiscal waterboarding. And I thought, wow, that's a brilliant analogy because it, it, it compacts so much meaning and emotion into economics, which is not necessarily that exciting to your, your average person, but that put it into to, to two words that summed up the whole, his whole position on, on fiscal austerity and the Greek economic crisis. Um, President Obama got into some trouble uh, some months ago when, when he described ISIS uh, as, a, as a JV team. Not, don't worry, they're a JV team. And it turns out uh, that that analogy was not as apt as it, as it might have been. And, and he's, he's caught uh, some, some flag for that. But you, you can look at, at most ads are, are analogies too. Uh, who here watched the Super Bowl? Let's have a show of hands. Okay, so we have a, a good showing here who, who watched the Super Bowl. And there was, there was an ad in there uh, that started out in a mountain village in Italy. Uh, and a couple was getting amorous and, and the husband says, wait a minute, and he goes to the bathroom and he opens a, a bottle and there's one blue pill left in it. And he tosses it back, but whoops, it misses his mouth. And it goes out the window and down a rain spout and ricochets off the church bell and, and, and ends up plopping down into this gas tank of this little Fiat which then, you know, pops out and becomes this muscular SUV, then a new crossover from Fiat, and, and, and this handsome guy drives off and all these women, you know, start purring at him. And 
and, and that's the power of analogy uh, because we, the, 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 it builds on this, this cultural knowledge that, uh, that most people watching the ad grasp and, 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 and take the meaning. And, and what's funny about that is it never mentions uh, Viagra, but if you, if you look at Viagra ads on TV, they use analogy too. There, there's one uh, that I write about in, in Shortcut where there's this handsome middle-aged gentleman sailing along and all of a sudden a piece of hardware breaks and the sail starts flapping loosely. And, and he, you know, takes the belt off his extra life jacket, t fixes the sail and, 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 and off he sails. And, and it's, it's very uh, clear what the message is, is that, you know, hard is better than soft. And, and being in command is, is, is better than being not in command. And, and that's, the, that's the power of analogy because we all have an analogical instinct. And this analogical instinct um, is, is, is how we process all the, the flood of information coming at us all the time. The, all the audio, all, all the sounds we hear, all the sights we see, uh, when I go to cross a street that I've never crossed before, I'm comparing it to every street I've ever crossed before and, and, and making that analogical comparison uh, between it, and it lets us make quicker, better decisions in general. And while there are many inconsequential analogies in this world, those that we do choose or, or accept or embrace often have big consequences. And I want to talk about uh, both some that lead us astray and some that lead us to greatness. In 1954, uh, a reporter asked President Eisenhower about the situation at Dien Bien Phu, where the French were encircled by, by the advancing communist forces and, and why should the United States care about French into China? And Eisenhower said, well, it's, if you take a domino and you tip it over, and the next one tips over and the next one goes, and, and you can be sure enough that the last one's gonna tip over. If we don't stop them there, then there goes Laos and Cambodia and, and Thailand and, and Japan, and pretty soon they're here. And a couple weeks later, the Secretary of State was talking about the domino theory. And, and the domino theory took something that was far off and abstract and made it very real. It put it into very kinetic, comprehensible terms. And that theory governed American policy for the next several presidencies. And, and we lost 50,000, uh, more than 50,000 soldiers. There were millions of Vietnamese killed. It divided the country. And, and the, there was only one problem, is that the analogy happened to be wrong. And we know that because we lost in Vietnam. And yet, the neighboring countries didn't topple like dominoes because countries aren't dominoes. Uh, that they, they have different geography, different leadership, different history, different politics, different um, economies. And, and so, to make that analogy was uh, to mislead. Now, it wasn't an intentional uh, deception, uh, but it was a seductive analogy that nonetheless misled people of both parties into some very disastrous and, and cumulative uh, decision making. Another example, more recent, would be the three strikes uh, sentencing laws that, that swept the country following a ballot initiative in California in 1994. It, it began after uh, a a father whose daughter had been murdered by some convicted felons in a robbery uh, couldn't get satisfaction in the state capitol in terms of uh, sentencing legislation to, to keep repeat criminals and violent felons in jail. And so he launched a ballot initiative that was called the Three Strikes and You're Out initiative. And that appealed to people's uh, 
sense of justice. Well, through, you, know, three, you get three tries and then you're out. Baseball is fair. Baseball is about definitive justice. Uh, baseball is about statistics. There is accountability for every action, more than any other sport. Every action uh, is, is on the ledger sheet, positive, positively or negatively. And well, people didn't think about, think that they were about baseball per se. All the associations of baseball were transferred onto sentencing policy. And what were the consequences? Not only did California overwhelmingly pass that uh, initiative, then about half the states uh, did as well. And since that time, our, our prison population has quintupled, and, and we're, we're, we've got more than two million prisoners, uh, and it costs us $75 billion a year. The problem is, is that a lot of those prisoners, their third strike was stealing a slice of pizza or breaking into a car to, to get change from a cup holder. There were a lot of passing bad checks, a lot of crimes that may deserve punishment, but don't benefit society when the punishment is, is incarceration for 25 years to life. Uh, and in fact, states have been rolling back these uh, draconian uh, laws because the analogy didn't fit. In, in baseball, as long as you're getting a piece of the ball or, or, and no one's catching the, the, the pop-up uh, on, on that third swing, you can keep swinging. Now, we don't want to say that you can keep committing crimes uh, as, as long as no one catches you, but, but, the, but the, the third strike is qualitatively different than uh, in baseball than it was in a, in a one-size-fits-all, okay, third strike, off to jail. And so that analogy has been very costly to our society over time. And then we reach the war on poverty, or drugs, or cancer, or obesity, or ob Ebola, or terror. And we declare war on these things because it's a shorthand analogy for something that matters, that's important to us, that we're willing to commit a resources to, that we can't give up on. And yet, it also carries a lot of baggage that becomes problematic for, for policymakers. So take the war on poverty. What's victory? I mean, is, are we talking about poverty in Bangladesh, or are we talking about poverty in Columbus, Ohio? What level? Are we talking about uh, if there are a million people in a city, if 990,000 are well-to-do and, and, and the rest are poor, is that, is that defeat, or where are those thresholds? The war on drugs, who's the enemy? Uh, is it the kid who's smoking a joint at a, at a party? Is it the, the kingpin in a cartel uh, in a foreign capital? Is it the dealer on the street? Or is it addiction? Is it the drugs themselves? All these questions uh, matter because when you declare war on something, you prevent people from backing out of it easily or changing course. And so there's this uh, hyping of intensity that, that feels good at first uh, when, you, when you're marching off, but when you're actually trying to solve problems, limits your, your thinking and, and, and limits your options. So those are some examples of analogies that, that have been costly uh, because they've, they're seductive, but they, but they led us astray. Analogies can be incredibly engaging and inspiring as well. And I'll give you a couple of examples. In 1939, 1940, uh, after the outbreak of World War II, but but before the United States became involved, the Brits were up, had their backs against the wall, and, and the Nazis were on the advance, and President Roosevelt wanted to help. But there were a lot of isolationists in Congress who said, it's a long ways away, it's not our fight, we're not getting involved. And finally, at a press conference, uh, 
President Roosevelt said, look, if your neighbor's house is on fire and you've got a hose, and he says, can I borrow your hose? You're not gonna say, hey, the, the hose is $15, fork it over. You're gonna lend the hose, and when the fire's out, you'll settle up, and if the hose has been damaged, they can make good on it. We need to send them munitions, we need to send them arms, we need to help. And, and that garden hose analogy, as it, as it came to be known, it came to be called, swayed the public in, in a big way and, and led to the Lend-Lease program that allowed uh, the Allies to hang on until we joined the war directly uh, a year later. Another example would be Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. What he did, and if you listen to his speeches, uh, I have a dream being just one example, you hear analogy after analogy, metaphor after metaphor. Metaphors are a type of analogy. And what he managed to do was set up the analogy between America's uh, struggle, and uh, African-American struggle, uh, for freedom in, in this country uh, to the biblical struggle for freedom uh, of, the, of the Israelites. And, and that uh, equivalence, that analogy that he was able to establish over time uh, helped people see things in a new way that they hadn't considered before. And, and that, that is the power of analogy, and you see the echoes of that movement because that led to the, to, uh, the women's rights movement and more recently uh, uh, gay rights. And, and these echoes keep, uh, keep rolling through history. And, and we, we often think of this as inevitable, but it's not inevitable because a lot of people had to change their minds and that was achieved through the use of analogy. And it just didn't just change people's minds, it changed cultural norms, it changed the law of the land. Analogies have an incredible impact in changing uh, our, our, the physical world in, in which we live and spark, by sparking innovation. And I'll give you a, a great example. Steve Jobs, when he introduced the Mac in 1984, which seems like ancient history now, uh, be before that time, very few people could use computers. You had to be a techie to do it, an engineer, somebody who knew m machines and coding, et cetera. And after the Mac, millions and millions and then billions of people started using computers. and, and unlocking the human potential that, that that enabled. And he did that through a simple analogy, the desktop, the computer desktop. Now we take the, the, the computer desktop and its folders for granted, uh, and its scissors, and it, uh, the trash can, and the paper clip, all, the, all those familiar icons on, on the desktop came from a physical, tangible desktop uh, that, that people knew how to use. And so did, he didn't invent the technology that, that made that possible. He didn't even invent the analogy that was actually uh, done at the Stanford Research Institute and Xerox. But once he saw the potential of it, he seized upon it and he actually got the rights to, to it for $100,000 in Apple stock, which was a, a good trade on his part. And he, by creating uh, this virtual digital desktop, he was telling people, hey, if you know how to use a desktop, you can use a computer. Well, I know how to use a desktop. I guess I can use a computer. And, and minutes later, indeed, people were using computers. And, and the impact of that was very profound because that uh, opened up uh, human creativity and productivity and ultimately the way we interact online in extraordinarily profound ways. And, and, and that, it was that key uh, conceptual analogy that enabled that, that transition uh, to computers.
Now, you might think, okay, John Pollock's cherry-picking examples. Not true, because once I started realizing this, I, I started going through all the great breakthroughs in history, technological, and saying, well, what were the, the guiding analogies? Well, as it turns out, Gutenberg in the printing press. Uh, he uh, saw, he was a, a metalsmith and a, a tinkerer, and he had this epiphany when he saw paper presses uh, that, that would take the wet pulp and, and press out the water. And he thought, hmm, well, what if you pressed in ink? Just that little reversal. And he, he, his father happened to be a, a, in the coin-making guild, and the idea for movable type came from all these uniform coins that could be exchanged in. They were just raised uh, images and a, adapted and, and uh, pressed uh, with ink, suddenly you had the printing press, which completely revolutionized access to information, accelerated uh, literacy in Europe, and, and enabled the, the, the modern uh, world to emerge from it. Charles Darwin uh, and the theory of evolution, he, when he set off uh, on, uh, on the Beagle, for his long voyage, one of the books he took along to, to kill time was uh, a new book that had just come out uh, by, by Charles Lyell on geology, in which Lyell explained that small changes over time, over vast periods of time, could completely change the landscape. And Darwin saw an analogy between uh, geology and biology and how small changes over time uh, in biological organisms could lead to, to huge uh, changes, uh, cumulative changes in the emergence of, of new species. Uh, and he, he, he went to test that out by breeding pigeons uh, himself uh, of different varieties. And, and he, he knew that farmers bred for uh, crops and for animals. And, and those two analogies led him to the theory of uh, evolution. The Wright brothers, now, I love this one uh, because I, I've always admired the Wright brothers. But for thousands of years, people have been trying to flap their way into the skies and without much success, uh, momentary success, shall we say, uh, and then straight down. They quickly discarded the bird as the analogy. They looked at the bicycle. They were bicycle makers. And a bicycle was an unstable vehicle uh, in three dimensions that required nuanced control. Uh, and the, the systems that they were very familiar with in bicycle in terms of steering, in terms of banking and leaning and control wires for the brakes, they applied to their aircraft and they beat out the, fed, uh, the federal government was funding uh, Langley at the time, who was the assistant secretary of the Smithsonian, uh, to build an airplane. And to Langley's credit, he wasn't trying to flap his way in, into the sky. He was trying to build a flying, powerful, stable carriage that wouldn't tip at all. And, and the, the Wright brothers were trying to build something that tipped a lot, and that's how you steered it. And so, so their key conceptual analogy, the bicycle, enabled them uh, to triumph uh, in one of the greatest uh, innovations in history. Uh, the moving assembly line. Now, Henry Ford gets credit for it, and Henry Ford did a lot of things, but he didn't invent the moving assembly line. A guy who worked for him did, uh, and his name was Bill Klan. Bill Klan uh, went to work for Ford for 17 and a half cents an hour. Uh, and he had been there, and, and at that time Ford was a startup. It was one of many uh, companies struggling to, to build this new thing called the automobile. And he came back from a trip to Chicago, and he had visited the Swift meatpacking plants, uh, where they, they had been cutting apart pigs and cattle on hooks on an overhead trolley, and then sending it on down to the next guy who would take off the next part. And he told his boss, I've got a better way to build cars. And his boss said, what are you talking about? And he, and he explained this process by which the pigs and the cattle were being disassembled. 
And the boss said, well, what does that have to do with what we're doing? And he says, don't you see? It's the exact same thing. And of course, it is the exact same thing. That analogy was very revealing, uh, but, but it wasn't obvious until he saw it and he stated it, or, or otherwise the Dodge brothers would, would have been doing it first, uh, or, or any of the other uh, pioneers in, in the auto industry. And it was so powerful, in fact, that, that not only was every other automaker soon imitating it, uh, every other industry was uh, imitating it. And to give you a sense of the impact that it made, uh, a car took 12, a uh, Model um, T took 12 hours to make before uh, the assembly line, and when, within four months, uh, they were making it in 90 minutes. And what did that let them do? It let them radically produce a lot more cars at a lot lower cost, put it in, into the reach, not just of wealthy, people but everyday working Americans and because the work was so boring he had to pay five dollars a day to, to keep the labor uh, and that helped people buy the cars that they were producing and, and, and really gave rise to the middle class in America all because Bill Klan came back from Chicago and saw this great analogy and so they can be really really profound I, I want to tell you one bit of the research I did on this. I went back to the Henry Ford Museum where I worked uh, some years ago and, and asked the archivist, I love archivists if they're here, uh, you know, you do a great, great service to this world. I said, what do we have on, on the origins of the moving assembly line? And she said, let me check. And, and there were these oral histories, as it turns out, that were uh, done in the early 1950s where they interviewed the old timers who were still alive, uh, who had been there at the beginning and Klans was one of them, and as well as several others who were there. And this, as the account goes, he, he begged to, 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 for them to try this idea, and Ford didn't like the idea, but they put the line in when Ford was away. And on the first day, there was an, an accident and, uh, with an engine block, and it snapped one of the workers' femurs, just and the boss stormed down from, from the office and said, if you're, what is this Rube Goldberg machine? We're, if you're, all you're gonna do is break legs, we're, we're gonna shut this down. And, and they shut the line down, and, and Bill Clans spent the next hour explaining how it worked, how important it was, and it, what an impact it could have. And at the end of the hour, the boss looked at him and said, break all their legs. Einstein said, uh, growth comes through analogy, seeing how things connect rather than only seeing how they might be different. It's a lot easier to say why things are different. It's a lot harder to see what unites and, and, and what the similarities are. And we live in this era of incredible challenges and, and, and seemingly insurmountable challenges and conflicts. And we're not going to solve them with the same cliches. We need new ways of thinking and we need new paths to common ground. And analogies offer this to us. Uh, the best leaders, the strongest leaders, the most persuasive leaders, the greatest innovators are those who master analogy. Show me a great leader who's not good at analogy and, and, and I'll, I'll be surprised. Look, uh, they're, they're good at analogy even if you don't think of what they're, they're saying as analogy. Those are the best ones because they just ring true. And in my book, Shortcut, I, I talk about how to break down analogies and, and, and how they can uh, highlight similarities and obscure differences, et cetera. But the important thing to remember is that we need to pay attention to the analogies around us. Because 
Analogies are arguments, and they're arguments with a spring-loaded conclusion. And we need to learn to recognize them in all their disguises. And we need to challenge those that we encounter. It's, it's really important when someone makes an analogy to say, well, why isn't that true? And sometimes if you're on a one -on, in a one-on-one -on -one challenge conversation with someone and they make an analogy that you disagree with, they say, well, what aspects of your analogy don't hold up? And put the onus on them. Because analogies are comparisons and some aspects are going to be relevant and some are not going to be relevant. But you don't know until you unpack them. And, and often we just accept the frame of argument that has been established and, and we, we, we swallow the worm and suddenly just find too late that there's a hook inside. And we can avoid that when we, when we challenge. And finally, there's always more than one analogy that can shed light on a given situation or circumstance or challenge. And so it's important that we, we try out different ones. If you hear a good analogy, you say, that's a great analogy. What is, what is another? And what, what will shed useful light uh, in, in a different way? The perfect analogy makes things as simple as possible, but no simpler. And knowing where that line is, is always the challenge. Uh, it's the difference between cliche and insight. Uh, it's the, it's the, the difference uh, uh, between going down the wrong path or, or, or going down the right path. And we can't avoid analogy. We shouldn't avoid analogy. Analogies are beautiful when we put them to good use and we, when we put them uh, to true use. And I hope that you'll never look at them in quite the same way again. Thank you. All right, we've got time for some questions. If anybody has one, yes, right up here on the front row. We'll bring you the microphone. First off, y'all here is that cork boat and the cardboard race held every summer 70 miles north of here. Right. Uh, <laughs> but, but the question I have is, I mean, as someone that likes to use analogies and puns myself, how did you get a literary agent and a publisher interested in writing a book about both of them? Well, this is out of the ashes of defeat come embers of hope. And I was trying to sell a book on an entirely different topic uh, some years ago when an editor rejected the proposal but said, hey, I see you won the World Pun Championship. How about a, a book about the World Pun Championship? And I, my agent relayed that to me and, and I said, I don't know, it doesn't sound that interesting to me. She said, well, what would make it interesting? And I said, I don't know, maybe a history of puns. And as it turns out, there was nothing that was not a stupid joke book or uh, academic. And the, and the, the, the smart uh, NPR listener's guide to the, to the pun had not been written. And so I set out to write that book. Uh, the, the, the sell on analogies, uh, was a, a little bit harder uh, because punsters self-identify and so publishers see a market that self-identifies. Uh, everyone uses analogy. This is, The Pun Also Rises is an excellent book. Uh, the Shortcut is, is an excellent book with a much broader audience. And so uh, it, it took some convincing, uh, but but, I, but it, I don't know how you sell books. It's tough. <laughs> yes, question right here. Thank you. It was very entertaining. Could you say something about your history as a speechwriter, the difference uh, in audience and message and sense of humor between Bill Clinton and Whip Bonnier? Okay, so I, the question is, how does a speechwriter 
adapt to different writers or different speakers who, who might have very different styles and approaches. I don't write for anybody who, who I don't believe in. And so David Bonnier and Bill Clinton share common values and our uh, democratic values, small d democratic values. Uh, and so that shift was very easy for me. They might have some policy differences, uh, significant policy differences, but the, the values uh, are the same. And so it, it, I wouldn't take on a, a, a someone as a client and I, and I work at the convention, so I write for a lot of people. It's rapid fire and you're assigned speakers. And, and there have been speakers uh, that I've declined to write for, uh, even Democrats, because I didn't think they were a good match for me. Uh, but uh, I don't look at it so much as the speaker's style, because that's a... Those are small adjustments. Uh, as long as it's in English, it's a small adjustment. Um, it's all about, for me, it's about empathy with the audience and really asking who, who is in the audience, what do they care about, where is the overlap between what they care about and what the speaker cares about, and, and, and how does that Venn diagram overlap? And, so it's really about empathy with audience, and so that's a much broader base uh, to operate from than it is, and it doesn't mean pandering to an audience, it just means talking about things in, in, in ways that they might relate to. So it's less about speaker and more about audience. Yes, sir, question right here. We'll wait for the microphone. Wait, so wait for the microphone, it'll get there to you. The, uh, uh, toward the end of your talk, the uh, issue was uh, cliches and analogies, and, um, and how to make that distinction. And so you're, you've said, be cautious, be cautious. And uh, I just suspect that you'd have uh, additional advice, uh, um, and we seem to operate so much on cliches. The domino theory is such a good example. Um, and so, um, kind of how to make that distinction. Can, can you say anything more about that? Absolutely. So I like to say that a, a cliche is a desiccated analogy. And it, it might have been insightful and fresh in its day, uh, correct or incorrect, but when the domino theory was propo proposed, it was actually a, a Navy admiral who had, had used it in a meeting uh, with Eisenhower a year earlier. He, he actually was arguing to nuke uh, uh, used tactical nukes, and Eisenhower thankfully rejected that, but he kept the analogy. And, and, and that analogy, you know, went on to a, a long and an unfortunate life. Uh, but it was a fresh way of describing things uh, at the time. Uh, the challenge is, and, and this is a challenge, is, is knowing when, when a cliche can be helpful. So R.V. Jones was the head of uh, scientific intelligence for the British Air Ministry during World War II. And early on, the, the, the Allies were losing huge numbers of bombers and air crews on bombing runs over Europe. And it was, uh, the, the statisticians were, were saying, this is unsustainable, we're, we, we cannot sustain this loss rate, what can you do? And so they set out to try and make their planes invisible. And, but of course you had the engine blocks and, and it was proved impossible with the technology of that time to make them invisible to radar. And so he had this sudden epiphany, epiphany, where do you hide sand, a grain of sand? You put it on a beach. And so instead of trying to hide the airplanes, he, he, he set out to make it look like there were thousands of airplanes. And so they just started eventually dumping tons of, of chaff, uh, in, uh, aluminum chaff, into the skies, and it was driving the, the, the German anti-aircraft 
uh, and, and interceptor planes crazy because these big signals would show up and it would just be a few planes and then they'd, once the resources were, were diverted defensively, they'd send in the bombers to attack uh, elsewhere and, and, it, and it dramatically cut uh, the, the rate of loss on the plane. So in that sense, a cliche applied properly was incredibly revealing as, a, as, a, as an approach to solving a, a, a big challenge. And, and so what I would say is that every analogy might apply at a, at a certain level. That's why it's important to try more than one and to, to zoom out at different levels of abstraction. One of the things that I realized in writing this book was that mathematics, mathematical equations, x plus y equals z, that's a, a, an analogy after a fashion too. Any value could be applied, applied to x and y and z, uh, just as, as two sides of an analogy, you can apply uh, you know, different, different values linguistically. Uh, and so it's a, it's a good question. There's no simple answer. But I would say it, it's look at what's not um, relevant and what's not similar. Uh, but you might find on examination that it's, it's highly relevant. John, tell the story that you told me about the speech you wrote when Bill Clinton went to Nebraska, the last state that okay. he visited. He, was this, he promised to go to all the states. His last state was Nebraska. This is a speechwriter. Okay, so. This was a f foreign policy speech uh, to be delivered at the University of Nebraska, Kearney. And the NSC, uh, National Security Council speechwriting staff, called me up and said, listen, we've got the speech covered, but can you do the, the local color? Can you do the intro at the beginning? And I said, sure, because I, I love that aspect of speechwriting, connecting a speech to people and to place. And I called up the library in the public library in Kearney. I did some research first, but then I called the public library, and and the, this is great. When you're when you're calling from the White House, people pick up the phone, and they usually stop what they're doing to be helpful. And this library, and I, I loved her. She said, "Can you hang on a second? No, the color copies are twenty-five cents. The black and white machine is ten cents. Oh, let me help you." And then she came back to the phone. Oh, can I help you? And, and it, was, it was great. And, and, and she sent me some, some local history. And I started reading the local history. And, the, and there was this an amazing story in it. And it was a, about how after the Civil War, there was talk of moving the nation's capital from Washington to a more central location. It had almost fallen to the Confederacy. Uh, it, might there be an, an invasion from another country? Uh, why don't we move it to a more secure location? And different cities or towns were vying for, for this great opportunity. And there was a land promoter in Kearney, Nebraska, who thought Kearney was the perfect place. <laughs> and it was, you know, you were far from Mexico, you were far from Canada, it was halfway between the East Coast and the West Coast, the land was cheap. And they said, well, how would you? pay for all the new buildings. And he said, well, there would be land spec, you know, there'd be speculation, there'd be a land rush, and, and we'd have revenue to build the, build the new capital. And, and they said, well, what would you do with the, all those marble buildings in, in old Washington? And he said, oh, turn it into an asylum. <laughs> and so I, 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 I saw that. I wrote that into the speech. And, and of course, President Clinton loves a good story and is a great storyteller. And he tells a story, and everyone laughs. And then he says, and having been here for eight years, uh, it is an asylum. And the people laughed again. And it was, it was, a, it was a fun little uh, grace note on an otherwise uh, more serious speech. Well, he, OK, we've got, we got time for one more question. You ask, did you have another question? Yeah, one more question. Where's the boat? Uh, the cork boat. Uh, that's another book. It's called Cork Boat, um, for those interested. Uh, is no more. It sails on only in memory. Uh, we, it was a, uh, in brief, the, the, the follow-up to that, that story was in the job interview, was that I, he told me, listen, you're going to have to give up the cork boat while you're working at the White House. And I said, sir, I understand. This is a demanding job. You've got my 100% you know, devotion and attention and time. And then I, I, within a few weeks, I had the, the Navy stewards at the White House mess saving corks. <laughs> 
uh, for the boat. <laughs> and when the, uh, after the election and, and after, after the turnover to, to, uh, to Bush, I was out of work again and, and I had time on my hands and I, I set to work really building that boat and we ended up taking it to Portugal, uh, shipping it to Portugal in a container and then trucking it up to the Spanish uh, frontier and putting it in the Douro River and, and, and sailing it down the river 17 days. We thought it would be an easy float through wine country and it turns into 17 days of hard rowing into the wind. Uh, and we, we left the boat and, and the, the funny thing is, is that the, the, the cork company that ended up sponsoring this trip uh, hired a, a, a publicity uh, person there to, to spread the word. And it was right after 9-11, uh, a few months after 9-11, the next year. And, um, and people really responded to this. Uh, the, the headlines were, friend of Clinton to, you know, descend Doro and cork boat. And, and so suddenly, I, I, completely unintentionally, I had become this unofficial ambassador, uh, and, and mayors were welcoming us uh, in villages, and, and they, literally with marching bands and fireworks, and <laughs> school kids were coming down to the, to the banks uh, uh, to, to learn about dreams. And, and, and it was so humbling uh, to to be representing, We've, we had the stars and stripes uh, uh, you know, flying, and it was so humbling to be just a citizen representing the, uh, the best spirit of America. And this mayor told me, he said, you know, for hundred, in a toast, in, in a ceremony, that, that for hundreds of years, you know, the Portuguese have gone out into the world and that nowhere was more welcoming than the United States of America, and that we are happy to welcome you back today. And so that's the story of the, of the cork boat.